harmonization uh, is desperately needed on this planet in terms of compassion, kindness, caring for others, doing for others. This is synchronicity. 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 Welcome to episode 85 of Synchronicity. My guest this week is the astoundingly excellent Jerry Brown, who, along with his wife Julie, wrote a book called The Psychedelic Gospels, which essentially explore the very psychedelic roots of Christianity, which is, I I have intuited this from other ways, um, but what is amazing about this particular book is how well-researched it is, how much rigorous studying and confirming with leaders in the fields, proving essentially that images of a particular, well, several, but in particular, Amarita muscaria mushrooms and also psilocybin um, appear in imagery across Europe, the Mediterranean, hidden in plain sight, um, as Jerry will explain. And really what separates this um, from a lot of other theories related to psychedelics and religion is they went after empirical proof. They wanted to verify um, their intuition. They wanted to confirm um, not only through uh, metaphysical means, but also through, you know, history, uh, anthropology, sociology, um, you know, ethnobotany, um, mycologists. They really wanted to confirm that this is actually what they were seeing and what they had discovered. It's an amazing story. Um, I highly recommend you pick up the book, The Psychedelic Gospels. Um, I think if you like this show, this is going to be right up your alley. Um, there are going to be links on that on the episode page at syncpodcast.com and also at mindpodnetwork.com. And in case you can't hear, I'm still dealing with allergies, seasonal allergies. It's just totally brutal this year. So if you have allergies, I feel for you. Uh, this podcast brought to you by seasonal allergies. Um, Outside of that, guys, everything is going pretty great with the new schedule. Like I said, going to be doing five, six episodes a month now instead of just four. Um, Thank you to everyone who's contributed on Patreon, which you can become a patron of this show and get some cool rewards and help me get some more episodes out, help me, uh, you know, pay the costs of getting out and do a lot of these in-person ones. This one isn't in person. Jerry's in California, but uh, I do a lot more of those and you're going to hear a lot more of those. So if you want to support the show, that's one of the ways to do it. I'm not going to tell you all the other ways. Tell a friend if you like the podcast. That's probably one of the best things you can do. If you like the show, let someone you know who might be interested in it about the show. Don't hold it to yourself. Share the wealth. Share the love. Um, That's I'm going to cut it super duper duper short this week. Going to have some announcements uh, next week about uh, Creative Evolution, which is launching, I think last week I said late May, it is now going to be June 8th, 2017. I will have details on how you can sign up for that. I'm going to have two different versions, maybe three of the course available um, at different price tiers. So, you know, you don't have to fork over a ton of money uh, and you can still get a pretty positive experience. The beta course wrapped up last week, really positive experience, got some to meet some really wonderful people too. Um, And in other news, I said I was going to keep this short, MindPod Network. Check out what's going there. Go to the podcast page. We have added four, five podcasters will be added to MindPod Network by the end of May 2017. We just added Adam Summer, who was a previous guest on this show, and I was on his show, Exploring Astrology. He's on MindPod Network now. We added Ellie Aaron, who runs a wonderful podcast called the Ellie Aaron Hour, uh, about a lot of the same things we discussed here. Um, She's in the Shambhala lineage, really cool chick out of New York. Check that out. Um, Who else are we adding? Daniele Bolelli. We're adding his Drunken Taoist podcast, so we're going to be syndicating that. Uh, we have a couple of other really cool stuff, um, on the horizon too, that I will share with you, uh, potentially a event, not potentially an event in August of this year, MindPod network event, fairly sizable in New York city is shaping up. So with that, with that now, without further ado, 
let's get to this super fucking awesome episode with Jerry Brown talking about the psychedelic gospels. You know, we all have had, and even a population of non-psychedelic people have had uh, prophetic dreams, intimations, unlikely strings of coincidences, uh, all of these sort of things. These are experiences which cultures deny. Cultures put in place, uh, I'm sure you've heard this word, a paradigm. And then what fits within the cultural paradigm is uh, accentuated, uh, stressed, and what doesn't fit inside the cultural paradigm is denied, marginalized, argued against. And we live at the end of a thousand year binge uh, on the philosophical position known as materialism. particularly fascinated about by you and your wife because uh like i said before we were recording we'll just consider ourselves rolling now um you know i have had several very intense macro dose experiences on mushrooms uh psilocybin you know, we're talking about the upper realms of probably what someone should do. So like, you know, between nine and 14 grams, um, uh, you know, which is <laughs> not a small amount. And what I've been struck by each time I've taken that much is clearly the religious and transcendent and spiritual overtones that seem to be present on all of these types of uh, entheogens, if we want to call them that. But particularly with mushrooms, um, I believe that I tapped into something that many people refer to as Christ consciousness, which is this energy or kind of uh, awareness that is Christ-like. Um, the recurring themes that I would say uh, are present in that are this idea of selfless service, compassion, unconditional love, and not in a conceptual kind of let's think about these things way, but an actually felt experience. So when she tuned me into the psychedelic gospels, which is this hidden connection between psychedelics and uh, Christianity, which you've written with your wife, um, I was just blown away because this here, yeah, I mean, and truthfully, you know, while we'll have links to the entire book and we'll oh. talk about it extensively so people can put, pick this up. But, you know, it's one thing to talk about the connection between psychedelics and Christianity and maybe some subjective or direct experiences we might have. It's totally another to kind of weave this narrative and anthropological story um, that is backed up by imagery um, to this day that has, from this stuff. So I would love to... I know there's a lot to cover here, and I know this is like a super long intro, and there's a question in here, I promise. But I would love to hear kind of... Um, your before we get into the book and the over overall general themes, I'd love to hear about you know what what led you intuitively or synchronistically, as you pointed out, to this connection that seems now, given what you've done, to be pretty apparent. Okay, <laughs> uh, that is a long introduction, and it is a good question at the end. <laughs> um, first of all. After my first LSD experience in 1963, mm. uh, high in the mountains of uh, Colorado, in the Rocky Mountains, mm. it was a tumultuous time in my life, and I had a difficult and challenging and somewhat frightening experience. Mm. Uh, you could kind of call it the... Uh, shamanism 101 where there are powers and counter forces and you know how do you balance everything and find a balance yes in, among that and and it kind of integrated bled over into my everyday reality <laughs> yeah um so 
being an anthropologist and a founding professor of anthropology at Florida International University in Miami, where we created the catalog and the program, I designed and taught this course, then called, well, always called Hallucinogens and Culture, Mm. which I started teaching from 1975 uh, up until 2014 when I retired, and it's still being offered there. Mm. Uh, I won't go into the details of the course, but it is all about humanity's interaction with uh, psychedelics or entheogens, chemicals and plants that generate the divine within. Mm. In the process of pulling together the case studies for this course, I really, and this is very comfortable for, for anthropologists, since anthropology is intrinsically an interdisciplinary right. activity. Uh, I had to draw from art history, from classical studies of Greek and Rome, from anthropology, from mythology, uh, from church history, uh, to name a few. Right. And of course, I had to, over time, understand and be able to identify, you know, many of the psychoactive plants from, from you know, cannabis to Claviceps purpurea in the Eleusinian Mysteries right. to um, Banisteriopsis, which is one of the components in ayahuasca, to the peyote of the Huichol. So having that background, when in 2006, my wife and co-author Julie and I on an anniversary trip were drawn to visit Roslyn Chapel, Mm. uh, which is right south of Edinburgh. We were going to Scotland. Um, We were drawn there by the Da Vinci Code's references to it, both in the book and in the movie. And while there, uh, the the Roslyn Chapel is the most incredible Catholic church you'll ever see. It's Mm. a synthesis of pagan and Catholic symbolism. It is, you know, more gouty than Gothic in that the stone almost seems to be living liquid that flows into Mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. And um, there are many enigmatic drawings there. There's a a, a famous apprentice's pillar with the um, serpent heads gnawing at the base, the dragons at the base of the tree of life (laughs) in Yadgar Sil in Norse mythology. And I could go on and on, but the main point is that there are uh, at least 100 green man heads pretty much united by a sinuous vine that runs through Roslyn Chapel. Hmm. And while we were standing in the front of the chapel in the most sacred place where mass is said, and I looked up and there is a a green man head. These are uh, faces that are wrapped in laurels or branches. Sometimes you can have vines coming out of the eyelids out of the nose out of the lips mm. so it's it's very much a uh, a fecund fertility symbol uh that you can find throughout europe and india mm. and this one particular green man just his expression which was enigmatic is he being sardonic is he being contemplative is he, <laughs> you know and i found a replica a plaster replica of that green man head in the gift store at Roslyn chapel two weeks later we're sitting, Julie and I, in an Italian restaurant in St. Andrews, Scotland, home of golf, the, the birthplace of golf. <laughs> and uh, I, Julie goes to the ladies' room. I p- reach into my knapsack. I look for the map. I pull out the green man head. I put it on the table. And I just kind of absentmindedly turn it 180 degrees. Mm. And there, as you and your readers can see on page 13 of the book, is sculpted upside down right over the pineal gland in the forehead of this green man, <laughs> an Amanita muscaria mushroom, which was very clear by the bulb, by the veil, and by the raised dots right. on the mushroom. Uh, years later, when we were actually writing the book, we met with the eminent mycologist, Paul Stamets. Mm-hmm. And I asked Paul, Paul, you know, would you consider this? Do you Could you confirm our identification, which set off our entire research, which I'll get to in a minute? Yes, yes. And he said, that happens to be a taxonomically correct Amanita muscaria <laughs> mushroom, <laughs> which is the mushroom found in the Soma of the Hindu Rig Veda, That's right. which is the mushroom used from time immemorial and still today by the Siberian reindeer herders, the fathers of shamanism. And that mushroom... You see if you're young in Super Mario Brothers. That's right, yeah. And if you're a little older, you'll find it in, in a lot of Christmas stories and in a, 
and the Scandinavian folk tales. That's right. And I said, Paul, are you sure? And he looked at me like, why are you asking me that? <laughs> um, and he pulled, he says, let me get my computer. He pulls out his computer and he pulls up photographs that he took at Roslyn while he was there. Uh, he says, not only is there this Amanita muscaria, but let me show you the other mushroom images mm-hmm. that are woven. Roslyn. Now, at this point, Noah, <laughs> Julie, and I, and we found some other references to passages in um, in the the Bible and in the the Apocrypha hmm. that were referenced or hinted at by Sir William St. Clair in inscriptions he left in Roslyn Chapel that referred to someone uh, a biblical figure of Ezra, you know, being offered a drink by the divine and drinking of it, and it shifted his consciousness. And he wrote and wrote for 40 days. <laughs> and it is very clear because the uh, it says, you know, from from this, you know, I, I was given this drink. Um, and um, it says so. Uh, and the next day, behold, a voice called to me saying, Ezra, open your mouth and drink that I give thee to drink. Then I opened my mouth and behold, he reached me a full cup, which was full, as it were, with water. Hmm. But the color of it was like fire. Mm. And I took it and drank, and when I drank of it, my heart uttered understanding, and wisdom grew in my breast, for my spirit strengthened my memory, and my mouth was open and shut no more. So <laughs> Julie and I, uh, I mean, after making this discovery, and then, you know, seeing these other hints to Ezra, then our minds were really racing. We're saying, is Sir William St. Clair in this Catholic church telling us something about the role of psychedelics in Christianity? Are there other images out there? If there's this image, are there other images? And, you know, I had heard or read a little bit about some of that, but I had discounted the idea of uh, psychedelics and theogens in Christianity due to the eminent work of the great ethnomycologist Gordon Wasson, yes. who said it ended a thousand years before Christ. Yes. Um, and now, you know, our, our minds were racing. Could this be telling us something? Is this the Eucharist of Jesus and the disciples? You know, the big, big question. And our minds were, you know, started racing, not only wildly, but almost to a rambunctious overthrow of reason. Yes. So at this point, we thought back. I, I remember the words of Carl Sagan. Um, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. <laughs> yes. And I said, well, this is an extraordinary claim, and we better go out, do the anthropological field work, and gather extraordinary evidence to, in the form of other images in Christian churches and cathedrals. And by images, I mean distinct images of psychedelic Amanita muscaria and psilocybin mushrooms right. in Christian art. By that, I mean in stained glass windows, in frescoes, in ceiling paintings, in sculpture, in mosaics, and in illuminated Bibles, which are Bibles that have either very fancy lettering and or, you know, paintings drawn mm. in to illustrate part of the text. And that's what we found. And we set off and did that research. And there is how the um, that is how we came to this research. So this is a, that, a thank you so much for that detailed and amazing kind of recapitulation of how this happened. And I love that, um, you know, I can trace back many of the th- places where I am now and how I got here back to my first LSD experience when I was 15. It was quite the 18 hour excursion, inner and outer. Um, So I love that that kind of launched you in this whole kind of connection between hallucinogens and religion. I also just want to touch on a few other things that you mentioned. Um, One kind of auspicious, uh, you know, aspect of, of what you just told is obviously the synchronicity of uh, meeting with your friend and seeing that these things actually do line up and it's anatomically correct. Um, but I also love that there's this there's this reharmonization when we're talking about Christianity in particular, really any of the Judea, re- really any of the Abrahamic religions. So let's just say Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. You know, there's there's this is another facet I'd love to get into, but there has been this subjugation of the female and the feminine divine for the past 2,500, 3,000 years or so, which has created a fair amount of disharmony in the world. But what I love about kind of the genesis of your book here with your wife and just 
the connections that you're revealing between psychedelics and um, Christianity in this case is that there is this harmonization, this balance of you and your wife uh, doing this together. Do you know what I mean? Like that, that is a very auspicious and not overlooked theme of how this came about because that to me is the key of how we start to piece together our past present and future um it is this harmony between these not just genders but the principles that are embodied uh between masculine and feminine so as as you kind of discovered this breadcrumb trail which must have just been such a thrill to see because it's like you said the extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence this book and you can tell just from hearing you speak about this too you're not just speculating you're not having some trip somewhere and looking at a picture and reading into it and saying oh here it is you wanted to make sure that this was vetted that this was accurate that as you continue to uncover more and excavate what was going on through the annals of history that this was actually borne out and in fact that is what happened so Maybe we could pick up kind of with the Gordon Wasson stuff and how he didn't really connect psychedelics to Christianity. And I know you have a theory as to why that potentially happened. But when he originally went down to Mexico, I believe it was, um, and met Maria Sabina, right, who was this shaman who kind of introduced him to the mushroom world. What what do you think? happened in those decades following where he kind of introduced mushrooms to the western world but also was careful not to contextualize them too much within his own religion as to kind of you know he was he was pointing out all these other religious connections but when it came to christianity that wasn't there could you could you elaborate or illuminate a little bit about what was going on there whatever and uh first of all i mean the first part of our book um about the first religion is in many ways, although we, we touch on the use of, um, of entheogens in many different groups of people from peyote of the, you know, Plains Indians and psilocybin of the Mazatec and uh, ergot in, in the Eleusinian Mysteries and ayahuasca among the Conibo and Hivero. You know, al- although we, we go ahead and do that, we mainly focus on re-summarizing Gordon Wasson's mm. eminent and pioneering discoveries in the world of ethnomycology, the way in which uh, uh, cultures interact with the mushroom world. Right. Uh, starting from you know his this brilliant discovery of soma uh, as the the enigmatic plant god and juice of the plant, as Amanita Muscaria in the Hindu Rig Veda, one of the world's oldest religious texts, mm. his discovery of a mushroom reindeer herder, reindeer cult that exists in Siberia from time immemorial. <laughs> uh, and for this reason, and as the Amanita using um, reindeer herders uh, spread out across Russia in about 30 different linguistic groups are called the fathers of shamanism. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is probably from that area that the original area, Aryans came in, in into India. And it is probably from that area that, you know, from 5th, 12 to 40,000 BC, that um, Asiatic people migrated across the Bering Strait, mm-hmm. brought this mushroom working worshiping religion with them and when they lost access mm. to amanita muscaria which grows at six thousand to eight thousand feet in the new world they actually investigated and found other substances right. plants from from the very bitter peyote and why because this was the portal to the supernatural world mm. which is the realm of true reality Yes. Or at very minimum, the realm of the afterlife and the before life <laughs> in shamanism. So there was a high motivation there. Um, in terms of Wasson himself, he then goes on along with the brilliant classical scholar Karl Rook, um, who's expert in Greek literature, and none other than Albert Hoffman, who first <laughs> synthesized LSD in his Swiss laboratory in 1938, didn't actually experience it till 1943. With they them as co-authors, he identifies um, an ergot of fungus, not LSD, mm. but an LSD-like related claviceps purpea as a psychoactive in- ingredient in the kiki on the potion 
of the Eleusinian mysteries that were practiced from 1500 BC to the 400s AD when mm. Christianity became the official religion of of, um, Catholic, of the Roman Empire. Mm. And then he goes on to also look at Maria Sabina. So we talk about all of that. Yes. But then when we get to chapter seven, the Battle of the Trees and this very image at Plain Keralt, uh, which is a small chapel in the center of France. It's only about 60 feet deep and 20 feet long, but on the back wall, there is this picture of, and it's plate five in our book, of Adam and Eve uh, standing side by side in the middle between them is a giant Amanita muscaria mushroom <laughs> with the white dots meticulously painted in neat little rows across the top. Adam and Eve are not covering themselves with fig leaves, but with mushroom caps. <laughs> and Wasson saw this in 1952. And in, as we say in the book, he kind of fled from it. He, he said, and he deferred to uh, an eminent art historian, Panofsky, that this is not a mushroom. Mm. Well, if it walks like a mushroom, talks like a mushroom, looks <laughs> like a mushroom, it's a mushroom, and many others have countered that. Mm. And we, we and 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 we point out in the book just you know a few minutes down the road is the Abbey of Saint Sauvain, where the Benedictine monks who created this whole story show in the creation a mushroom and a tree. <laughs> so they're saying, hey, we definitely know the difference between a mushroom and, <laughs> and, 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 a, and a tree. Um, and then we so and then we go on to St. Um, Martin de Vic, only two hours away from Plankerop. But let me come to Plankerop because yes. that's where this whole battle of the trees starts. And if this is indeed an Amanita muscaria, as others have confirmed, as we believe it is without doubt, um, as the guide to that chapel uh, told us, as bishops have written about over the years, then that says there is evidence of psychedelics in Christianity mm -hmm. beyond Rosalind. Mm -hmm. uh, if you deny that at Wasson, as Wasson did, then you know, and, and being the preeminent authority on mycology, that kind of put a damper on the field yeah. for decades. <laughs> Just a little, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and also, I accepted it as well. I mean, of mm. course, you know, it kind of makes sense. Psychedelics in Christianity, are, are, are you kidding me? <laughs> um, you know, I wouldn't have believed it myself had I not seen this along with Julie with my own eyes. So this is very important. It's important because it is the, be, you know, it starts off this whole conversation of additional evidence. Mm -hmm. And then if we look at what is being depicted itself, there is the famous scene of Adam and Eve, uh, the temptation scene in the Garden of Eden. And if you look at plate five, uh, Adam and Eve is partially skeletonized, as is Adam, as you can see. Mm. And the serpent is offering Eve uh, a round object, which could easily be a mushroom cap. Mm. Now, to come back to what this story is about, Wasson finally came to the conclusion that this there was Amanita muscaria known to the people who created this portion of the Bible in the Old Testament. And with the coming of monotheism, it was suppressed. Right. But what does this story really show mythologically? Because if you read Genesis, it's amazing. And I, I, I'm going to just paraphrase it sure. in Genesis. Hey, Adam, hey, Eve, you have this wonderful place. You have dominion over all of the creatures, the land, the sea. All your needs will be met. You don't have to go to school. You're never going to pay taxes. <laughs> um, enjoy your life. Oh, but one thing in the center of this Garden of Eden is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you eat us thereof, then surely you shall die. Mm. Now, Adam is, okay, God's word, we got all the rest, and the serpent who can represent evil or who can represent knowledge right. and healing, as it does, comes to Eve, comes to Eve, not to Adam. And he says, you know, if you, if you eat of this, then you will be like unto God. It will open your eyes. And Eve does, mm -hmm. and she achieves this higher awareness. And she says to Adam, you know, Adam, you got to try this, <laughs> yeah. all right? And Adam's, no, 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 okay. And everyone knows the rest of the story, uh, 
although there's some fine points there that are fascinating. So now it really gets interesting, though, because, hey, God does not kill them. That's right. So what does it mean for surely you shall die? Yes. Does it mean your ego will die and mm. you'll achieve a higher consciousness? And there's a later passage in Genesis gets even more interesting where God says they have eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What if they eat of the top tree of immortality and become as unto us? Now, I don't know who this us unto is. us. We're yes. At, we're not at the Father, Son and the Holy Ghost yet. <laughs> but the important point here is that in Christianity, this becomes the original sin yes. committed by Eve, the beginning of the battle of the sexes, the beginning of the stigmatization of women in all kinds of ways yes. that we're still living with today, you know, over 2000 years. Well, we were talking about Genesis. I mean, thousands of years later. Yeah. So is Eve really the creator of original sin or is Julie and I believe, was it the woman who had the wisdom and the courage to bring man to higher consciousness. Thank and you. That's, that's what we think this is about. And that comes back to your point of the reintegration of the feminine. Yes, yes, you're tying it together. And let's look at culturally and where we are in historical time. And we don't have to get into the whole idea of time as an illusion or Maya or samsara right now. But um, look at how these plants are emerging all around the world. I mean, ayahuasca, this has been just one of the most insane things to witness. I remember my mom and my stepdad now, they they met in Peru in the early 2000s. And, you know, there were people going down there, but it was nothing like it is now where there's ayahuasca retreats all over the country, the world. It's, it's this, it's having a moment. If we think of this as kind of the feminine principle emerging from Mother Earth, we do see this reintegration and harmonization. And I love this story of Genesis you're talking about too, because yes, we can look at it, like you said, as the beginning of original sin, or we can look at it as a wonderful allegory for what you mentioned is for ego death, for showing the difference between the interconnectedness of everything, yet being aware of duality, um, consciousness raising through potential psychedelics. I mean, this all does seem to weave together um, in a way that makes more sense than I think would meet the eye. And I love that you're touching on the reemergence. I call it the reharmonization of uh, the, the feminine principles. I, I think this word balance is used quite a bit, uh, both personally and collectively. And I think some, some of us sometimes get the idea of kind of the Libra scales of things being equally weighed. And I think sometimes with the principle of harmony, like if you're playing a chord of three notes, a triad, sometimes the tone of one of the chords needs to be a little bit louder and played a little bit with a little more velocity. And I think where we are right now, the notes we should be playing with a little more, more velocity are those qualities typically associated with the feminine divine and the feminine qualities? We need more compassion. We need more cooperation. Um, we need more authority, feminine authority throughout culture. Um, so I love, you know, we didn't plan this talk out at all, but I love that this all does kind of lead to this point, which is when we're talking about mushrooms um, or my favorite plant ally, cannabis, I think these things are imbued with this femininity and this consciousness that is really, um, you know, I don't want to say it's a panacea, but something that's needed medicine uh, for us individually, collectively, and globally. So I love that this kind of fits in with what you've been discovering as well, you and your wife. Hello, Synchronicity listener. I'm here in the middle of this show to let you know about the Facebook community on, for Synchronicity. Uh, we have a page, of course, for Synchronicity, which you can find, but there's also a private Facebook community, which you can access through SyncPodcast.com, S-Y-N-C Podcast.com. You'll see a menu item, request access. I will look at you. If I like the cut of your jib, you make the cut, you get in. That's it. So I hope to see you there and back to the episode. Uh, two things there. Um, the you know obviously a reharmonization uh, is desperately needed on this planet in terms of compassion, kindness, caring for others, doing for others, and obviously the feminine principle brings that in very strongly. Mm. I also think that um, what's happening both 
on every front with the um, worldwide migration of uh, ayahuasca, mm -hmm. ayahuasca retreats of um, interest in LSD microdosing for yes. creativity and problem solving and healing. And for the realization that some people have in their experience of ayahuasca, also known as visionary vine, that, that God, the God that they come to through the wisdom of the plant as a woman mm. in some cases. But I also think uh, from my knowledge, experience, and the pretty considerable reading I've done is you can't really categorize uh, these experiences because uh, these some of these psychedelic experiences can be incredibly intellectual. Mm. Steve Jobs loved LSD. He said it helped him think different <laughs> in creating Apple. Uh, Crick, the co-discoverer of the DNA uh, helix, said he visualized it during an LSD experience. Uh, it's LSD. It's, uh, mescaline has been used very effectively in, in, in scientific, mathematic, architectural problem solving in a very famous experiment. Uh, that we talk about in, uh, in chapter 14 of our book. Yes. So, uh, you know, there's a variety of experiences, but coming back to the, the research itself, and I, I just want to say, and I know you'll, you'll put this out there, that many of our photos are available on our website yes. at psychedelicgospels.com. And of course, you can, you know, find them and own the book or on Kindle or paperback uh, on Amazon or any bookseller of your choice, which you can get to directly or through our website. Um, that out of this, so this is a very interesting Old Testament uh, Genesis image here in the Garden of Eden. Yes. And um, however, we go over two hours away, Julie and I, to St. Martin de Vic Church, a small parish church. And here we, we the colors of this, uh, the frescoes that were made in the 1100s, are so stunning and are so emotionally warm that, as we say in the book, walking across the threshold of what on the outside is a pretty drab church with a plain brown door, it's like having cataracts removed from your eyes. We walk into the into the choir, and on as shown in, in plate six, the purification of Isaiah's lips and Christ's entry into Jerusalem, on the wall of the choir uh, is... Christ sitting on the ass, entering Jerusalem, his disciples behind him. And Julie tugs on my arm and she says, do you see what I see? And I look up there and I say, oh, yes, I see what you see. And here on plate six of our book, The Joyful Youth, which is a, a photograph, and Julie took all of the original photographs of this fresco, uh, one of the joyful youth of the three that are greeting G, uh, Christ and unfurling their robes to welcome him is holding on to the stem of a very large and distinct psilocybin mushroom <laughs> cat. It's tan, it's smooth, it's different than the palm leaves that are being collected in other parts of the scene. And it is also huge. And in Romanesque art, size matters, mm. okay? That that mushroom in the church in Plain Corral was as huge as Adam and Eve, and these psilocybin mushrooms are as large as the boys' heads for a reason, because... Um, the artist is telling us this is important. Right. We ch our eyes travel down to the next wall perpendicular to this Christ's entry. And there on the towers of Jerusalem, another color picture in our book, are the youth cutting down with the same long kind of knives, psilocybin plants from the towers of Jerusalem. Mm. And if that were not enough, this sits right over the, the painting, the fresco of the Last Supper, which has the same long knives on the table, the same sliced mushroom caps. And if you look very closely in plate nine, uh, drawn into the hems of the disciples, uh, to the left of Jesus are four distinct mushroom caps. Mm -hmm. And it was in this, this sequence of events of seeing psychedelics in scenes from the New Testament that really uh, gave rise to this aha moment right. where Julie and I realized this is a psychedelic gospel. That's this right. is a gospel that's different from the uh, canonical gospel uh, in the New Testament, different even from the many ways from the Gnostic gospels. 
And this is telling us there's a different master story. There's an alternative history of Christianity. And that's not too far-fetched because it was Pope Gregory in the 6th century who said, let art be the Bible of the illiterate, because yes. most people were and remain through feudalism illiterate until the coming of the Gutenberg, Gutenberg, yeah. Gutenberg Press and the beginning of printing. And one of the first books that was printed was obviously the Bible. Hmm. So this was where the religious instruction was going to take place. Mm. And then we became pretty convinced that we had a so solid hypothesis. We said, okay, you know, this is this is St. Martin de Vic, this is Plain Corral, this is Abbey of saint Stevin. They're pretty close to each other. You can get to each other in a, easily in the day in the center of France. Is this some marginal Catholic cult? <laughs> is this some you know, renegade hippie faction of the Benedictines or other order? frolicking about on, on you know magic mushrooms far from the, <laughs> right. the king and the church. So we decided to go to the high holy places of Christendom, to go to Chart Cathedral, to go to Canterbury Cathedral in England, to go to Hildesheim in Germany, which was created by Saint uh, by Bishop Bernard, who became sainted by the Catholic Church. And there we found additional evidence mm. uh, to confirm our theory. So as you're discovering more and more evidence that is at some point kind of a discovery, but then at, at a certain point, I'm sure just confirmation, um, continued confirmation, what is this doing for you and Julie, you know, personally? I, I imagine there have been psychedelic experiences that you've both had that also directly, there's two ways we're coming at this, right? And this is another great thing about what you've done here, what you've both done, um, is you're connecting empiricism and science with mysticism and mystery. And that is, to me, the nexus point of where we need to be right now. Um, I don't think it does anyone any good to be just a scientific materialist reductive to, and I don't think it does anyone good to be totally out in outer space into new agey woo woo world without no grounding. I think providing, providing this spectrum and this connection point is incredibly important. So what was going on as you kind of uncover and then confirm that, whoa, we potentially are looking at a psychedelic gospel. Whoa, there are mushrooms and allusions to all of this stuff, not just, as you said, kind of some weird Ken Keesian kind of cult that maybe emerged from Christianity, but this is actually the root of what's going on. What are some of the thoughts you're having as you're kind of going on this anthropological kind of mission, Easter egg hunt, kind of? <laughs> yeah. As you can imagine, many. Incredible <laughs> excitement at these continual discoveries, at this moment of discovery, of, of being able to you know, photograph and capture it and write up our notes and organize the photos and plan where we're going next. And uh, many, many synchronistic events happened <laughs> along the way yeah. that also confirmed that we're in the flow. We're definitely on the right track. Yes. And we see these synchronicities when they are repetitive and almost right in your face, unmistakable <laughs> yeah, yeah. As, as really signposts that confirmed that we were, you know, fulfilling our, our destiny, doing the right work, mm. and that our theories were, were to be confirmed, number one. Number two, you know, we had moments of, you know, what is the, the response going to be to this? Mm. Um, you know, will this be accepted uh, in, in the academic community, in the media, uh, by the Catholic Church? What will their difficulties be? How much blowback would, would, would there be? Mm. And, but... Also, Noah, and you said this as eloquently just a moment ago as anyone I ever heard, <laughs> talking about you know bringing you know science and, and myth together. Um, this was a if you if you stretch it out a confirmation because Julie and I uh, had our first authentic experiences with the divine, with God, with the sacred, whatever you want to call it, mm. through psychedelics. Right. And this is what you know moved us into believing that, as you, however you want to phrase it, as my mother said, that that God is a river of love that flows from the universe, or as Stanislav Grof, you know, said it so beautifully that that you know the universe is permeated with an intelligence that in an altered states of consciousness we can access. So it kind of brought all of this together because yes, of course, if this is a documented pathway through the divine. 
One, we know it in our own lives. We know it from vast amounts of anthropological uh, research that psychedelics, not the only pathway, but one very uh, confirmed pathway for shamanic people from time immemorial, going back at least 10,000 years in the archaeological record and maybe 30 to 40,000 years if the cave art interpretations of France are borne out. Right. That this long connection is there, that Christianity itself emerged from a circum Mediterranean area that was rife with mystery cults, uh, the Therapeutae, rife with um, cults that we know and, and actually religions such as the Eleusinian mysteries mm. uh, practiced in Greece, definitely at the time of the birth of Christianity, using a psychoactive potion um, as in the Kikion uh, of the Eleusinian mysteries as confirmed by none other than Albert Hoffman, mm. the famous Swiss uh, chemist. Uh, it's not a huge stretch to ask the next question and say, if this was the original Eucharist, if part of uh, Jesus and his disciples awakening mm -hmm. to their divinity and their immortality was through sacred plants that were put here by God, mm. um, why not? <laughs> um, so, so, you know, it, it, it does, it is plausible. And then, you know, for those of, uh, for you and, and others who may know, not know about um, the miracle of Marsh Chapel, which is actually a scientific experiment, also known as the Good Friday experiment, that was take, undertaken in 1962 by Walter Pankey, who was a graduate student uh, in divinity uh, under Timothy Leary before Timothy Leary and his friends um, were expelled from Harvard. Yes. And it was a brilliant experiment. What it does, it asked the question, was could synthetic psychedelics um, actually cause or induce in this case, psilocybin, a mystical experience. Right. So Panky uh, took some volunteer uh, divinity students. He took them to a small room in Marsh Chapel, which is a chapel at Boston, on the grounds of Boston University in Cambridge. On um, Good Friday, he gave one of them, and the, it was a double blind, so the researchers did not know whom they were giving the psilocybin, and to whom the 30 milligrams of psilocybin and to whom they were giving the large dose of niacin B3 as a placebo because it'll make you feel flush. Wait, wait, the just to be clear, you're saying they were given 30 milligrams of, of psilocybin. psilocybin. What, was it intravenous? Was it, how was that? Uh, it, was, it was capsules. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. So now <clears throat> um, the result of that research was that nine out of the 10 divinity <laughs> students who received the psilocybin had an authentic mystical experience. Houston Smith, who passed recently, became a very eminent scholar of religion. He said it was the most powerful cosmic homecoming he had ever experienced. And that confirmed what he had thought and written about and, and knew about religion. It ex confirmed it existentially for him. Right. Um, Another gentleman who is the um, um, the uh, uh, a, a psychologist, an American psychologist, said this is the best design. There are no experiments, and I quote, known to me in the history of scientific study of religion, better designed or clearer in their conclusion than this one. And none other mm. than Rick Doblin, the founder of MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies. Rick twenty did a twenty five year later follow-up study where mm. he found seven of the original participants in this study wow. who received the psilocybin and they said it continued to be the you know the persistent positive um reality in their lives right. that it was by and many of them uh, a genuine experience that had value then and all through their lives. This was found six months after the experiment and 25 years after <laughs> right, the experiment. Right, right, right. So, so here's, now we have, and, and this study is a beautiful illumination of a fusion between mysticism right. and science. Right. Um, and, and this is what this entire psychedelic renaissance is, is bringing about, given, you know, the known and continually revealed ability of and theogens to reveal mystical experience That's right. uh, in, a mo in the most profound 
way. So this is where it certainly uh, all comes together. And if this is the truth, <laughs> then there and this was known to Jesus and the disciples and to the early church. It is no wonder that this would be perpetuated uh, in secrecy. Right. And I want to stress secrecy is not suppression, as some people have complained. Right. Are co both complained and claimed uh, who think the church suppressed this. Obviously not. This is in Bishop Bernard's church. He became a saint. He was the tutor to Otto III, the Holy Roman Emperor. This is no renegade group. Right. But it was as in all of shamanism um, that this is sacred. Uh, so this is done in secrecy. This is done in hush, hush tones. This is done in ritual settings with uh, extensive preparation. And so uh, it would be not a huge stress to believe or to understand that early Christians understood the healing and the godly properties of psychedelics and would want to perpetuate them. And as we show in the book, it is only with the chilling coming of the Inquisition mm. that these images drop off and right. begin to disappear from Renaissance uh, Christianity on into modern times. Right. So you can see the proliferation being there, even if secretive, like you're saying, mystery schools, these things aren't there to suppress or hide there to make sure people are prepared. Um, it's kind of like if you're going into a trip, um, you know, a psychedelic session set and setting, you know, make sure you're bringing in the right intention and aspirations to it. It's, it's not something to kind of keep people away, but as you pointed out during the inquisition, then it really starts to actively be suppressed. And I wonder if it was actively suppressed in the beginning and then just completely forgotten or just, you know, the same way that many elements of science now just completely berate the concept of organized religion just as being faulty on its own. And we clearly can look at the missteps and ways that religious powers, you know, can be co-opted and abused. But just kind of this lopping off, and it's kind of like the counterbalance to look at all the suffering that religion has caused, so let's not do it. So it, it's interesting that as this Inquisition, as war and murder and beliefs and horrible things are perpetuated throughout the world, they kind of lose touch with this psychic kind of aspect of what maybe was getting people in touch with the real divine. Um, so that I find fascinating. And I love that you point out that it wasn't suppressed to the point where this isn't available. Like you're, you've proven you guys went around and took pictures of this stuff. It's still there. So uh, I love that you have that kind of uh, qualifying difference between it being suppressed and, and really hidden in plain sight, as you put it. Sure. I mean, look, uh, just a, a couple of points here. You know, the, the we, we link the Inquisition to the horrible Black Death, the Black mm. Plague of Europe, which mm. killed, by some estimates, up to 60% of the population of Europe in a very short period of time from mm. 1347 to 1352. Now, the church, which is supposed to have the hotline to God, couldn't protect people from this. Right. And so they blamed it. And they blamed it on the witches, and to a lesser extent on the Jews. Right. So now, because you ask, how do the wise women of Europe, who are <laughs> the feminine uh, keepers of the herbal knowledge, of the psychedelic knowledge, of the herbal medicinals, of the aphrodisiacs, how do these wise women who have served their European villages uh, in, in childbirth and, and others, arts of healing for hundreds of years, how do they become the witches of the Inquisition. Mm. How does Santa become Satan? How does the horned god of shamanism that you see in the cave paintings with the shaman wearing the horned robes of, of the reindeer of another animal become the devil right. of Christianity? Right. This is where we link it to. And it's also here that we find out in while we're at the Vatican why Gordon Wasson refused to... <laughs> pursue his theory of the role of theogens in religion, you know, past the hallowed halls of Christianity. <laughs> yeah, you might bump I up into some also, stuff. Yeah. 
and and that that's one of the reveals. You'll just have to read our book <laughs> to find out <laughs> why why Wasson, and it's quite dramatic uh, why Wasson did not do that. Yes, uh, we really believe that this uh, interesting this resurgence of psychedelics, the psychedelic renaissance, mm. and theogen reformation, new science of psychedelics, as as different people have called it, um, is really going to lead not only to a cleansing of the doors of perception, as yes. Huxley described it, but to a resacralization of the doors of perception and bring an experiential component back into religion that I think for the large group of people, growing group of people, especially the youth who say, look, I'm spiritual, but not religious, <laughs> right. um, can, can be a very um, amazing experience and that's why we call for the creation of sacred centers mm. where uh, you know to become legal under the first amendment of the u.s constitution where people can go and explore psychedelics for personal growth and religious oh. purposes we understand that ayahuasca is legal uh in the context of the santo dime church in the united states right we understand that people are going down to costa rica right and and south america to experience these retreats directly, that there are psilocybin retreats springing up in the Caribbean islands. That's right. So all of this is going on, and hopefully it will take place in a responsible uh, setting. The other point I want to make is, at the end of the day, Noah, we don't believe that this work has to be seen as a fundamental challenge to much to anyone's faith in Christianity, right. to much that is beautiful, in Christianity, and especially to the amazing, you know, powerful teachings of Christ consciousness <laughs> that are expressed uh, in the Sermon on, on the Mount, um, to be sure. I mean, this is such an amazing, uh, you know, radical departure from the Old Testament that you should love your, your neighbor, hate your enemy, as it was taught. But I say love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate mm. you, and pray for them which deceitfully use you and persecute you. This is really looking at the world from the most expanded form of consciousness that it is all, you know, it is all there. Yes. It is all part of creation. It is all part of some gigantic cosmic dance of, of balance and creation and destruction. <laughs> um, and even though evil does a lot of harm in the world, that, you know, the only way we're going to, we're going to evolve is if we bless and forgive those That's uh, right. who have harmed us, not only for them, but also at the profoundest level for our own healing. Because if you harbor resentment and anger, it's, it's going to affect you at, a, at every level. And so when we say, look, this doesn't have to be seen as a challenge to Christianity, but as reintroducing Christianity to a mystery that's part of its origins, as we believe, and is found in many, many of the world's religions. Uh, including yes. Buddhism, including uh, the Hindu religion from the Rig Veda on, including yes. Judaism, uh, where there is also evidence about you know what was the mana of the uh, of, of the Exodus. Right. So and and here we cite Brother David Stendel Ross, oh, one of my the favorites, Order of Saint Benedict, oh. and he he says the following: you know, if if I can experience God uh, through a sunset on a mountaintop, why not through a mushroom? Prayerfully ingested mm -hmm. uh, i mean and he is one of my absolute favorites he's got so many amazing quotes and just such a spirit that is helping the world i mean what you're saying <laughs> truthfully there there was another uh jewish person a long time ago who you've been referencing who said a lot of similar things and when you're talking about not radically altering or being at odds with the tenets of christianity um that couldn't be more spot on i mean this is an inclusive uh, religion at its heart, regardless of what certain people in this country may have co-opted it for. Um, you know, it, it really is like, that's the heart of what you're talking about. This is something that if we can embody those things you're talking about, um, treating everyone as you want to be treated, forgiving people when they do things that you don't like. And I love that you bring up, you know, there's evil in the world. Well, Ram Dass has a quote that I use a lot on this, uh, podcast, which is suffering is the sandpaper of our incarnation. And what that means is, is this is kind of the force that we rub up against to get us to be a little more smooth and 
depending on what we believe happens before we were born or after we die, we may want to be a little smoothed out. And if we look at kind of the global individual and collective problems that we face, they're all similar types of problems. We don't have a ton of unique problems that no one else has in the world, despite the fact we may think that sometimes. So we can use these opportunities that are provided to us in a dualistic universe to kind of get into those core principles of interconnectedness, selfless service, unconditional love, but really embody them in a way that isn't just conceptual and isn't just intellectual, but really live it. And I, like you, you know, have experienced when you're in that flow, when you're really doing what you're supposed to be doing, we do, we get the benefit of the, what Jung referred to as an a-causal pattern of orderedness, which is synchronicities. And I love, 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 Jerry, that you and Julie were able to go on this expedition um, and kind of connect these internal and external worlds uh, in such a profound way that I really think as time goes on, it's going to be more and more appreciated. Um, it, it's truly an amazing thing. I mean, uh, as Thank I, you. I really, yes, I mean, all credit deserved because this connected a lot of dots um, in my life. I've been talking about Christ consciousness as a Jew for oh, going on 15 years, and sometimes it feels pretty weird, but when you have a direct experience, um, you can't really shake it sometimes. And to see how you've connected. Oh the dots of the mascaria, if I will, uh, together, it's pretty incredible. Um, and I, I'm yeah. just so grateful that you guys embarked on this and really, uh, you know, it, it's happening at the right time. You, you mentioned the psychedelic renaissance that's going on. Um, it's, it's truly, it, it's a miraculous thing to, to behold. And uh, I'm just glad that there are people like you out there kind of, uh, you know, holding the space for some very profound things that I think are, not in the not too distant future. Well, as a writer, and I can speak for Julie on this, nothing could be more gratifying, <laughs> you know, to hear this kind of response um, that, that you've just just given us. And I just want to emphasize that uh, Julie uh, took all of the photos. Uh, these are her original photos of these entheogens in Christian art in churches, cathedrals throughout Europe, the Middle East. Uh, art we captured from the museums uh, holding the artwork of Egypt showing prominent entheogens. Mm. Uh, Julie, who is very uh, perceptive visually, made a lot of the original discoveries, as you'll mm. find out in, in reading the book. And uh, I wanted to write an academic book first. You know, I was very <laughs> concerned yeah. about this theory. And Julie said, no, we have to reach a broader audience. This is mm. too important. We don't know how long we're going to be around. And so uh, be, as being a, a, you know, intuitive researcher, and a, a, as I found out after 35 years of marriage, you know, my wife is a brilliant editor. <laughs> the reason, a, a large part of the accolades this book is receiving and the reason this book is so readable and is what it is, is a combination of sort of an anthropological meditation and a travelogue and a discover, journey of discovery is because of, uh, of Julie's work. And I just want to, uh, you know, completely acknowledge her for that. And um, yes, behind every great man, my friend, we we know what to be the case. So I end uh, with three questions, and then I think I this one is this. I think it's behind every great woman in this case. <laughs> yeah, no, on. that's that's probably how it should be. Let's let's start using that one a little bit more prominently. <laughs> Um, so I end with three quick questions and then one larger one. Um, so we'll get to that. And I just, you know, maybe in the future we could, we could do this again and talk about some other things that maybe aren't directly related to the book, but kind of had to do with the part of your career where you're teaching the hallucinogens as related to religion and culture. Cause there's, there's just so much there. Um, and I can get the sense that, you know, you've been steeped in this stuff for decades and, you know, as much as I can do to mine your wisdom, I'd love to. Um, but here are the questions. They may seem a little silly, but they're not. What is your favorite color? Okay. Oh, right now? Yeah. Yeah. I um, <laughs> um, Blue. Nice. What's your favorite number? Nine. Cool. What's your favorite animal? Bear. 
Cool. Uh, and the last question, what's a practical tip that has helped you in your life that you could share with listeners right now? Practical tip. All right. As my former father-in-law said to me when he asked, do you know what a rich man is? I replied, I have no idea what a rich man is. He says, it's very simple. It's a man who knows when he has enough. Hmm. And to me, that was very practical and helpful. Uh, being at that point in my life, trying to figure out which way to go, what's really important. And under and out of that, I developed a deep and profound sense of gratitude mm. for what I had instead of focusing on what other people had and who had more than me and why didn't I have more and, and et cetera, et cetera. And out of that deep and profound sense of gratitude for what I have and where I am, I was able to evolve you know, this career that emerged before you by being happy with following my own truth. Yeah. And this is what Julie and I have, have woven together. And that has you know, created so many blessings uh, in our life that continue to unfold of uh, you know, being grateful for what you have and following, following your truth, no matter where it leads. Yes, yes. And I'll, I'll leave with a quote of someone you brought up before. It's Brother David Seindel Rass. And it is, it is not happiness that makes us grateful. It's gratefulness that makes us happy. So you couldn't couldn't have said it any better, man. Thank you so much for doing this. Please extend my sincere love and gratitude to Julie as well when you speak to her and see her. Um, this has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I'll thank Jen for tipping me off to you guys. And really, anything I can do to help um, with the book or anything you guys are working on, please consider the lines of communication open, and I am happy to help. Thank you, Kyla. You know, we all have had, and even a population of non-psychedelic people have had uh, prophetic dreams, intimations, uh, unlikely strings of coincidences, uh, all of these sort of things. These are experiences which cultures deny. Cultures put in place, uh, I'm sure you've heard this word, a paradigm. What fits within the cultural paradigm is uh, accentuated, uh, stressed, and what doesn't fit inside the cultural paradigm is denied, marginalized, argued against. And we live at the end of a thousand year binge uh, on the philosophical position known as materialism. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you want to find out more about the Psychedelic Gospels, Jer Jerry Brown, Julie Brown, you can go to psychedelicgospels.com. There's also a Facebook page. You can find interviews with them on a variety of other podcasts. Check it out. Um, really cool people. Um, didn't get a chance to talk to Julie. Hopefully next time. But Jerry, as you can tell, very cool dude. Um, if you want to support the show, rating and reviewing the podcast helps. You are more than welcome to donate. You can also become a patron on Patreon. Uh, you go to patreon.com slash synchronicity uh, and you will see that. You can also join the email community, which is growing in numbers. We're over a thousand people. I know I said billions maybe early on in the show. That wasn't true. I was lying. We don't actually have a billion people on the email list, but we are past thousand. Things are going well. Uh, doing some cool stuff there. At the very least, you get cool gifts every week with a quote. You know, not, that's pretty good, I think. Uh, thank you to everyone who listens past the music. Uh, have 
pretty good feeling that I'm going to get out an EP. Not a pretty good feeling. Going to be releasing at least an EP. That's four songs in fall of this year, 2017. Maybe an album. We'll see if I can get it together. Got a lot going on. And stay tuned for Creative Evolution if that is something you're interested in. And I know I realized, I just realized I forgot to mention exactly what that is in the intro. This is a course that is designed to help you maintain and sustain a creative practice, which has numerous benefits uh, in your life. So if you're a creative or an aspiring creative and you want to kind of kick it into high gear and turn that corner, uh, I got a course that I made that can help you do that. So stay tuned for info on that. That's it. That's it. I will see you next week.